Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Hey, Porn Sack, good to see you. Good to see everybody. Welcome to Word Balloon Live, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Porn Sack Pichette Show is uh, joining us. Did I do it right, Porn Sack? Yeah, yeah, totally. Right, good deal. Excellent, man. Fine, uh, fine writer, director, has done a lot of TV work, and uh, now is going to thrill us uh, with uh, his new comic book. Is it out yet, Porn Sack, or is it? Uh, it comes out in the next Wednesday. So what is it? Uh, a week from a week from this Wednesday. A week Excellent. from this Wednesday. We're going to be talking about the good Asian today. Uh, man, very cool. Noir set in uh, San Francisco in the 30s. And Portek, I really appreciate uh, where you're coming from on this thing. And I'm going to let you talk about it. But what I love is people like yourself and Ron V is another great example of guys yeah, great. and women that are cleaning the basics of these kinds of stories and putting the modern spin and, frankly, the deserving spin that these things needed uh, because uh, I, I think the locale and the period is fasting. And I think good stories can be mined from this stuff. And I love what you're doing, but Bob, I appreciate that. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Yeah. The good Asian is it's a genre we're calling Chinatown noir. It's a 1936 detective mystery uh, featuring the first generation of Americans who grew up uh, beneath uh, underneath an immigration ban, the Chinese. Yeah. And so it's meant to be sort of a classic noir with a Chinese American protagonist. And I, and I think one of the things, you know, to going to what you said is what we really want to do is to tell a classic noir with all the twists and the turns and all the tropes, but kind of put it in this sort of genre, uh, not the genre, but this lens of uh, American history at the time. So one of the things that, you know, the inspirations for this was that me discovering the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, the Immigration Act of 1924, where Asians and Arabs weren't allowed into the country. And yeah. it came during this time where in the 1930s, there was this huge popularity in Asian crime solvers like Charlie Chan and Mr. Moto. Correct. And so I wanted to do a story, you know, I wanted to, to take one of those type of characters and do a story that actually acknowledged the history, the actual racial history that was happening at the time, but also do, you know, a really fun mystery that has all the aspects that I love in, in a Philip Marlowe or a Sam Spade or Continental Ops story. So that was, you know, that was part of the, the impetus for doing it. Understood, man. And no, that's, that's the great thing about these noir stories. Usually when there's a detective hero, everything's up against him. You mentioned Marlowe, Sam Spade, people like yeah. that. And obviously, even more so when it's uh, a Chinese American yeah. facing the the unfortunate uh, circumstances of the day. You know, I'm Greek, 
Mm. And my, my grandfather came here in the 1890s. Mm. And obviously mm. being, you know, white, obviously had an easier way of, you know, uh, immersing himself in the American culture. But obviously, you know, he, he still, you know, yeah. spoke with a foreign accent. So he had his issues. I, you know, man, I will confess as a little kid, I watched the Charlie Chan movies. I watched the Mr. Moto movies. And again, unfortunately, um, didn't, didn't understand the level of disrespect that unfortunately some of those movies had. But by the same token, I'm glad that a lot of, even though they didn't play the lead, a lot of Asian actors got the opportunity to act in those movies. Yeah. Yeah, and, and at the at the beginning, like uh, the original, very first uh, actor who played Charlie Chan, he was Asian American. So there, no there was, yeah, 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 yeah. It it, it didn't, uh, you know, it didn't work. Apparently, the audiences didn't show up, and wow. so that's when they 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 cast a Swedish actor to play Asian American. Oh, yeah, Sydney yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, but no, there there were sort of opportunities there, and again, I didn't know that. I, you know, wow. So much of this history. Uh, was stuff I discovered very late in life, very, very late in life. And so much of the impetus for doing this book was the fact that I couldn't believe I discovered it as in, in late as light as, as I did. And so I wanted to, you know, uh, make, you know, have it be fuel for a story. And the, the goal is to, you know, to tell sort of a noir story that a genre that you're familiar with. And all this racial specificity and historical specificity actually makes it different while still keeping to sort of the true sense of what it what it is. So so yeah. No, absolutely. So tell me Edison Hawk, right? That's your Edison yes. Hark. Yes. Pardon? Edison Hark. Edison Hark is yes. Please. Is our the name of our protagonist. He's an Amer a Chinese American detective. He comes from Hawaii, which at the time uh, was the only state that had Chinese American cops. Uh, mainland America wouldn't have a Chinese American cop until about 1957, and so Hawaii was the and only I place where you had Charlie. Them. Charlie Chan was a Honolulu detective yes. as well. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Both so both Edison and Charlie Chan as act are actually based on the same detective. Uh, detected by the name of Chang Aperna, who I think was a cop around 1910s, 1920s. And like Chang Aperna's life is like a comic book. Like he had a bullwhip because he used to be a cow. He didn't carry a gun. He had a bullwhip because he used to be a cowboy. He had a scar in his eye because he got into a fight with someone with a sickle. Like he would get thrown out of windows and land on his feet and then run right back in. So he had like this crazy life. So, and, and like, I couldn't do, like if I did anything approaching his life on a comic book, it would seem too comic booky. It would seem like a Dick Tracy sort of thing. But he was just a, yeah. But he was this amazing sort of figure in history, and and that was kind of you know where Charlie Chan drew his inspiration and where I drew my inspiration for the character. And the other thing about you know his job at the time was he was used primarily against other Chinese uh, other Chinese people. You know at the time they didn't need a Chinese cop to write tickets. They needed a Chinese cop to um to go into chinese opium and gambling dens and come back out and say okay these are all who all the troublemakers are these are who you need to arrest and you know at the time they he would be used to sort of round up chinese lepers to send them off to malachi and so um and so i wanted to that was an interesting conflict that i kind of wanted to look at through like sort of today's sort of racial our understanding of, of racial dynamics today and sort of examine like okay what was that like for him sort of as a for him as a person and so my character edison hark kind of uses that as a starting point and you know is a very different character than the, the historical person that Chana Perna is but um but yeah but but that's kind of where the character starts and from there he gets a uh telegram to come to San Francisco to search for his adopted father's uh missing love and in classic noir fashion he stumbles on a big can of worms that kind of unravels through the course of our our book again the environment of the period um how immigrant networks would help especially specific to their creed yeah. would help each other out. Again, the Greeks did the same thing, man. Yeah. In yeah. terms of you know, all, all the immigrants and stuff, the Italians knew who to go to, the Greeks did, the Germans, everybody, and certainly the Asians, and, and yeah. in particular, the Chinese, and, and again, the Japanese as well. No, I think this is amazing. And again, I know you've got uh, the Tong gangs yes. involved in this, and I think that's really fascinating. And also both the legitimate business side of, of getting things done and the the sneaky you know stuff that was going on uh, you know under the table as yeah. well. I think it is a, a great area to explore. And again, uh, uh, you were really kind to send me 
uh, advanced issues. Uh, and, uh, and really, man, I'm digging the story. It's great. I'm glad. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I really, really appreciate that. I know I, you know, it's funny, the book comes out next week. So I'm still at that like pins and needles of being like, you know, are people gonna like, you know, like, you know people gonna catch what we're dropping down and, and all that. So we'll we'll see, but I, it means a lot hearing that you liked it. It really, really does. Oh, that's really kind, man. Well, listen, I mean, already a couple comments if you didn't already see them. So yeah, John says, this is awesome. And uh, Jimmy as well. And you did, you've been doing a great job in terms of promoting the book. And that's what made me leap was, I've, you know, I've seen your posts before, but I'm like, hey, Wait a minute. I absolutely I'm, want to talk about I'm this. so glad because oh, I feel yeah. like I've made every conceivable mistake on Twitter and Instagram. And I, I'm i constantly amazed. Like when, when I think I've made all the mistakes, there are constantly new ones I'm making. So I'm very relieved that you heard about it through social media. Absolutely. Is this your first comic? Uh, no, my first comic actually was Infidel. Uh, that was also released uh, from Image. That was about, I released that in 2018. And okay. uh, that was kind of when I learned the ins and outs of sort of comic book Twitter. And and so, yeah, so now I'm kind of, you know, trying to take what I learned from Infidel and sort of apply it. And we'll see how that goes. Like every day, I, every, I, it's, I find, I tweeted recently that like, whenever I put something up on Instagram and I get a message, my first instinct is like, oh my God, someone's telling me I screwed something up. Like that is always the first instinct I get when I get a message on Instagram. No, man, again, it, 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 it reads well. It looks great. Um, the, the conflicts are unfortunately, you know, part of the times. And again, that's why it, it re Edison is really cut from the same cloth as like a Philip Marlowe or somebody else in terms of y you don't know who you can trust and you try to make, uh, you know, connections. But uh, it's kind of tough when you're really the only guy out there. And not only in terms of the, the barriers that he faced from the white community, but also the Chinese community not really yeah. willing to trust him and everything. Yeah, I mean, it was great. I, you know, I, I'm a big believer of, you know, trying to take sort of the, the the genre tropes and sort of lean it into the specificity of the things I want to explore. And so it is sort of a like you know the whole man without a country is such a staple of noir. You know, the man with nowhere where to turn kind of thing. Yep. And so to play that with sort of this added extra sort of racial sort of element that is sort of a commentary and analogous to sort of an allegory of sort of, you know, uh, of what Asian Americans or some Asian Americans might go through the time. Like that's fun. That's where I get a, yeah, that's where the juice comes from me. Understood. Is this a limited series? Is this going to be an ongoing uh, series? What do you it, think? It, so, so right now we're slated at nine issues. And the idea is if the book finds an audience, we have more stories to tell. I am so superstitious. I cannot commit to anything more until we know what our audience is like. But uh, I would love to tell more. That's great. Tell me about uh, your collaborators on this. Oh, yeah. So uh, we have some great ones. Uh, Alexander Tofengi does the art. And Alex is amazing. He's a European comics book artist who... Um, who had done sort of a lot of sort of those European band destiné, but he kind of his first American work was Outpost Zero with Sean McKelly over at uh, over at Skybound, okay. and his art is so great. He's, I mean, I it, it, it Alex is one of those great collaborators that I I am almost at a loss of, in terms of where to start. Like his art is you've seen the art, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, his he's got a great sense of storytelling. He's a great collaborator. The thing I love most about Alex is that. He has this amazing ability to convey two emotions in a single kind of shot and uh, in a single panel. So I'm constantly sort of amazed by sort of like what he does. Um, you know, coloring it is Lee Lowridge and Lee, oh, I've known from my Vertigo days. Lee oh, is amazing. Man. Yeah, he's amazing. I mean, I, I feel like he's probably most appreciated for like Deadly Class with like such a distinctive color look on that book. And that was one of the reasons why, you know, we wanted him for this. And like, and we, we and I've known Ed, Lee's actually the very first person professional in comics I've ever gotten like a drink and hung out with. Oh, that's and great. so, yeah, he's such a good guy. And so, and so we exposed a bunch of different colorists to Alex. And Lee's like such a good friend that like, you know, when you're working with someone that close, you're just like, is it like my personal feelings that are like leading me? But like Alex saw Lee's work and was just like, this is a guy. Like this wow. is like so, in, you know, so novel, so, you know, so bold. Like, and so that was, he was great. Jeff Powell uh, is my letterer and slash designer slash production. And he's amazing. Uh, we work together on Infidel. You know, he's he kind of comes from the Marvel ranks and I he's just got, 
one of the things you'll see in uh, the first issue is the other thing that I'm actually kind of excited by is that even though a bunch of reviewers have sort of seen preview copies, the 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 actual printed issue will have a couple like design and back matter pages that aren't in the PDF, primarily because I'm bad at math and like I got it wrong. <laughs> and so I like I thought we didn't have any more pages in there. And then Image was like, no, no, you have more pages. Like, oh, I guess we should fill them. But um, but he, he did this like title design spread where with like kind of a foil sort of a foil uh, trim and the foil trim is actually a maze with a distinct in and out point. And like, he, he just puts that extra level to everything that he does, you know? So right. like, yeah. Yeah. So, so so he's awesome to work with. Uh, my editor, Will Dennis, is like one of my oldest Bobby friends Rose. in comics. Uh, well, oh, Will, okay. you're doing well. That's great. Oh yeah. Will's the editor. Will's like my like we were I used to be a Vertigo editor, so we were, you know, I learned from Will uh when 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 I was an editor and he's like one of my best friends. He's like, you know, the guy who recommended my first Chandler novel to me. Like there was that's no true. one else I could think of. Like he know like He's one of the best comic book editors. He's one of the best crime editors. Like, so he's one of my best friends, like such a no brainer, like working with him on this. And he's made the book so much better than I would have ever dreamed. And Dave Johnson, which is like totally a fanboy dream of mine to like have covers by Dave Johnson, yeah, who is uh, crediting uh, your interior artist, but the no. others, these are Dave's covers. So, I mean, yeah, like, and you know, and for the longest time, like, you know, Dave is the bar that I set comic book covers to, you know, like not just in terms of like being bold, but also being clever and like finding ways to say things and like having that kind of design sense of like, you see a striking image, but you're also looking at it for a while being like, oh wait, there's this cool thing he does with this and that, you know? So like the idea, and like, you know, I've worked with Dave in the past in Vertigo. So it's just a chance to, you know, work with him again. It was all great. And then, and then we've had like this great string of variant cover artists, you know, Sana Takeda did our first issue. Um, Annie Wu did our second, uh, Jen Bartel did our third. We've got some other people, awesome people lined up. So I don't know. I, I feel really, really lucky with the, with the team that we've got on board. That's amazing, man. Um, I, I want to know. So what, what books at, uh, at Vertigo did you edit? Uh, I edited, let me see. I, I edited Sweet Tooth with Jeff Lemire, uh, Day Tripper by, uh, Gabriel by Fabio Moon. Um, yeah, the brothers. Uh, Unknown Soldier with Josh Dysart and Alberto Ponicelli. Nice. I love that series. Man. Oh, good. I'm glad. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. That book has a very special place in my heart. Um, uh, the Unwritten with Mike Carey and Peter Gross. Um, I did Swamp Thing for a little bit, working with uh, working with uh, Josh and uh, Enrique uh, Breccia. I worked on a Hellblazer graphic novel with Jamie Delano and Jock, Hellblazer Pandemonium. Um, I, you know, those are my main sort of editorial books. I've also worked on, you know, supporting Karen um, Berger. So uh, with her, I worked on like We Three with Grant and 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 Frank Whiteley, and the originals with Dave Gibbons and uh, The Fountain with. Uh, Kent Williams and Darren Aronofsky. So I, wow. my time at Vertigo was a. I I love my years at Vertigo. That they're people. I they are like my comic book family. That's you know I whenever I have Dave on, I always have to like spend at least uh, ten minutes on the originals, and I love uh, it so much. Yeah, and, uh, and he's yeah. so good too. Well, Dave's a yeah, Dave's a champ. I mean, my God, yeah, what a wonderful guy. And I always tell him, I'm like, dude, you've got to put out a playlist. Of, oh, he like, totally you know, needs songs, to. Mod he totally needs to. Yeah, I've been telling him this seriously, man, for like fifteen years. I'm like, yeah. let's take, do it. Jesus. He totally needs to do that. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> and and really, man, no, you just rattled off a bunch of my favorite uh, Vertigo books, and and really working with Will again. Yeah, oh, he's so great. He's so great. And now too, like he works. I think like, he's working on some of like Image's best books. You know, with some of their like top talent from like Scott Snyder to Jeff Lemire and Remender. Like, yeah. I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky he makes time in his day for me. <laughs> no, but that's great, man. And again, yeah, I mean, I it's so funny. For years, I wouldn't have been able to talk to you because DC, you know, uh, yeah. really wouldn't let anyone talk. You know, they wouldn't let editors yeah. talk. And I'd see Will at shows, and I'm like, there's going to come a day, man. <laughs> right, right. right. They're going to loosen up, or you're not going to be there anymore. And I'm going <laughs> to yeah. demand a conversation with you. Yeah. Literally, as soon as they made the move to Burbank and he stayed, I'm like, all right, when are we talking? And he's like, <laughs> to decompress, and then we'll talk. So That's awesome. And this That's is great awesome. that we're talking now, man. No, honestly, I have so much respect for the entire Vertigo original crew. Um, you know, Karen, obviously. Yeah. and. And Shelly Bond has become a decent, you know, a, a good friend, a decent friend, a very good friend. She's she's been lovely. 
uh, with her time. And so, no, really, honestly, man, I, I love hearing Vertigo stories and everything because I think it was a, it was a very special imprint. And I'm really sorry they dismantled it. And it's so crazy that now they're like, oh, hey, DC is going to put out a new horror line. I'm like, what <laughs> horror line? Yeah. What the hell? And even all the Black Label stuff, it's like that stuff could have easily fit into Vertigo. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Oh, well. But it's all right. And that's okay because now you've all moved on and you've all, you know, up your game well, and you're doing this yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, I, and the other thing I think is really cool, too, is that, like, there's a Vertigo person in like every major publisher now. So like, you know, so like Vertigo is still around. You're just not finding it in one place. You're finding it spread out all through comics. No, you're absolutely right. Oh, here's Aaron Davis. Daniels, excuse oh. me. Hey, he read Ed Videla. Oh, it was the first time to make me gasp out loud. Is there a particular logic for when the ghosts would appear in the comic? Excited, yeah. uh, excited to uh, read The Good Asian as well. So in order to, to, in, in, to answer that question, yes, there, there is a logic. Um, I think mostly going back, it's so funny. I, 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 I'm so, I, at the time when the book was coming out, I never really talked about like anything behind the scenes because I wanted sort of the readers to kind of like put, put it together. But at the same time, it's been like two years. So I think it's, 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 it's time enough to do that. But the oh, way we sort of saw it is that um, the, the, the ghosts had, well, let's start the with motivation. The, the premise, because I didn't. Oh yeah, make, good, good point. Good start point. with the premise, so, and then we'll go to the ghost. In, yes. So, Infidel, we kind of build it as a haunted house for the the twenty first century, and it's about a um, an um, a Pakistani American Muslim woman, uh, and her multiracial neighbors who live in a building that they start to learn are haunted by, for lack of a better term, racist ghosts. Yeah. Ghosts that sort of feed on this sort of xen you know, okay. xenophobia. xenophobia. Sure. And so, wow. it, it's a, we, we start off with our protagonist. Um, and so to use sort of the shorthand of sort of the racist ghosts, the way we sort of looked at them was they kind of wanted an, um, their, what they wanted was a magnification of what they wanted in their life. And what they wanted basically was validation. They wanted, you know, if they hated someone, they wanted to know that they were right and wanted everyone else to hate them as well. And so the motivation for the ghost was A, to terrorize the people that, you know, that they consider to be intruders in their home. But, they're all, but the secondary uh, goal for that was also, they wanted everyone else in the building to to agree with them and so to see them as threats as well. So that was one of the reasons why they were terrorizing the um, the protagonist in private, but also in public. And that was kind of the reason Detra for doing it. Thank you for asking that question. Absolutely, no. I'm glad to see again that people are jumping in. I, you know, I'm I apologize, poor Zach. I didn't I didn't have time. No, to there's a heavier, but I'm so glad people are watching and are are absolutely you know hooked in and and know you know your work and are excited yeah. about Asian man. That's fair. yeah, no, I. I, I, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Very, very cool, man. Oh, there you go. And Aaron says, thanks for the answer. Absolutely, man. Very, very <laughs> Thank cool. You. Thank so, you for uh, yeah, so, all right. So nine issues for Good Asian. How, yes. uh, how big was Infidel? It, Infidel was five issues. Okay. So this was, this, I, uh, it's almost twice the commitment uh, for, on my end that, 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 in, that Infidel is. Is Good Asian one story in nine parts, or is it a couple stories in nine parts? No, it's one story. It's one story in in nine parts. However, uh, we we zig and zag along the way, so there are like you can consider there being like little short stories within sort of those nine nine stories. Hopefully, it all kind of comes together. But uh, the goal certainly is, and I think you you know you've read the first three issues, so you kind of sort of see that you know uh, I. I I'm fond of people who kind of, you know, coming from Vertigo, I'm fond of people who kind of take chances with how stories are told. So the story is not necessarily told as linearly as as one might expect. Sure. Is, uh, and and will it be collected then as a nine issue collection? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. That's the goal. And if, if it's not, no one's told me yet, but but that is certainly the goal. No, I understand. D tell me the differences of uh, of putting something, in. so was Inf Infidel was also an image, excuse me. Yes, image. Yes, okay. Infidel was also image. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, you know, doing like, what have you learned doing this on your own versus when you know you were working over at uh, Vertigo and everything? You know, that's a really good question. Um, the the one thing, I mean, and and, it, and it's just sort of a compliment to image that like there's so much sort of freedom, uh, with there's so much so much freedom it, it with image and part of that is the ability. Cause, you know, because I taught, you know, I tackle stuff about race in, in 
in my book. And they're, they're topics that can kind of be, you know, has the potential to be controversial. And so there is definitely a version of, if I publish this book at Vertigo, you know, I may or may not have had to run things up the flagpole and make sure everything is comfortable with it. And I think the thing I was really grateful for working with images, I didn't have to do that. So I didn't have to sort of second guess or protect those ideas. And one of the things I think that's grateful for both books was I had the luxury of sort of just being honest. And as a result, for Infidel and even parts of The Good Asian, it, the world kind of caught up. Like, you know, cause you know, the, the, we work on these books so far in advance. And so, you know, and so it, when, especially with something as sort of polarizing as sort of race, people coming at it from different perspectives, there can be this temptation of being like, I don't know if this is fair. I don't know if this is correct. I, maybe you should see this, say this from this perspective. There's none of that working at image. And as a result, it's just your compass that's going with it. And I think because of that, I could kind of put something, commit something to a page. And then it's for Infidel and, and, and parts of Good Asian as we're starting to come out, it's been sort of fascinating to watch the world, you know, reflect it so heavily and be kind of like, oh, I guess I was onto something a lot more than I thought, which, you know, not to say I wouldn't if there wasn't more corporate influence, but um, but it's just an easier you know it's a more easier one to one relationship, and and that, and that's just the yeah. wonderful way image is set up. Well, that's cool, and yeah, unfortunately, I'm sorry. The book is as timely as it is right now as well. It's a, it's a shitty dude. I've been saying this. It doesn't matter what race or creed I'm talking to. Uh, as I mean, I'm I'm in my mid fifties, and I really thought uh, the majority of us were past a lot of this. Yeah. Book. Yeah. Right now. And it's a sad reminder that we're not. And, and in some ways, unfortunately, with all the pain, there's the reminder of we can't rest. We can't, we yeah. can't stand by and think, okay, things are better now because clearly they're not. And yeah. everybody's got to, you know, do their part and, uh, you know, get, get back to where we should be or, or if, we, if we ever were, but move forward with the idea of, hey, man, you know, we're all, we're, we, I mean, just the obvious, we're all equal. Yeah. We're all. We all should be enjoying the American dream as best as we can. Yeah. And it's, it's fucked up, man. I'm very sorry that it's as shitty as it is right now. Yeah. I mean, the only, the, the closest thing I can sort of take to solace from it, and I hope that uh, this is actually true, is that the, the hope at the very least is that at, at the very least, at least it's all crawling out of the woodwork now. So you can kind of see the problems from what they are as opposed to sort of, you know, hiding so that they can kind of snipe you when you're least sort of expecting it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I and no one on the book really expected the book to be as timely as it's kind of become. Sure. And so, and that's for me has definitely been kind of like that, you know, that's definitely messed with my head sort of a little bit in terms of how do I talk about the book and, and all that. But, you know, I, what I sort of tell myself at the end of the day is like, what's happening now is part of a larger context. It's part of a larger historical context. And unfortunately we've allowed ourselves to forget the history that brought us here. So uh, it makes it a little easier for me to sort of talk about this sort of stuff with the hopes at least of, you know, no nine issue comic book is going to sort of change the world and make the world a sort of a better place, but hopefully, you know, if anyone gains a little bit more context for like where all this stuff is coming from, I think that's a good thing. Understood. And forgive me for asking, but specifically, uh, are are you Chinese? What is your background? So I kind of self-identify as Thai American, but I'm Chinese. I'm ethnically Chinese on my dad's side. You and should. so, and, and one of the places where this book kind of came from was uh, in, in my house, it's funny. The reason why I, I self-identify as Thai, Thai American is because growing up, whenever my mom and dad would have arguments about politics, whenever my dad was like losing, he would just be kind of like, ah, oh, this is the problem with Thai people. And my mom would be like, what are you talking about? You're Thai. <laughs> and then he's just like, and he'd be like, no, I'm Chinese. It's like, you've never been to China. You don't speak the language. Like, no. Um, but but as my dad got older, he got more um, he got more obsessed with his sort of Chinese roots. And it was, you know, okay. in his in his last few years, it was all he could talk about. And so after he passed, like part of processing his loss was kind of, you know, getting back to know this, all this stuff that he cared so much about. And in that process, learning more about China, I learned more about Chinese American history. And that's where I really just started to learn about the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Immigration Act of 1924. And, and so in, in a lot of ways, like that aspect of, you know, of my family really kind of brought me to to, to writing this book. 
Mexico. Did I pause? Hang on. Oh, okay. All right, we're back. Sorry. Okay, sounds good. Hey, it wasn't you. Good. All right. All right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we blanked out for a second, so you might want to start that point again. Uh, oh. About, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I know we got we got the gist of your father getting into uh, his okay. roots beyond being Thai himself. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so my, my dad, um, so as the older, in his later years, my dad uh, got more obsessed sort of with his roots, um, you know, as, as he got older. And uh, when he passed, sort of part of my processing his loss was to like, you know, see, explore this thing my dad was sort of obsessed with. And so that interest in Chinese or China led me to, uh, you know, a deeper understanding of Chinese history, Chinese American history. And that's where, you know, and the discovery of the Chinese Exclusion Act, Immigration Act of 1924, and all of that kind of like led me to to this book. Understood. You know, it's uh, the American Experience, I think, just ran a documentary about Did the they? Exclusion oh, Act. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'll, have to, I'll have to check that out. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. And again, uh, I understand, you know, and also that, uh, I, <laughs> forgive the laughing about your mother and father's argument. No, no, I laugh about it all the time. Well, and honestly, it reminds me because truly me and my family, we always identify when uh, in uh, Analyze This, I believe, Robert yeah. De Niro's talking to uh, Billy Crystal about the Oedipus Complex, and he's explaining it to him and stuff. And De Niro just sh shakes his head and goes, fucking Greeks. And really, <laughs> there are times in the Greek culture that me and my family were just like, fucking Greeks. That's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> and that's truly, man, and that's the point. A lot of this shit, sadly, is to a degree universal. And yes. uh, again, my grandfather's immigrant experience is a lot different from your family's immigrant experience. But, you know, again, it's uh, in, in some ways, uh, I think we can identify and, uh, I, I, you know. I, yeah, I 100 percent agree with that. Like, you know, this book, while it's about sort of Asian American history with the Asian American protagonist, like I do think like. I think it doesn't, you know, it's about immigrant America at the end of the day. It's about the immigrant American experience. And yep. that kind of ties all Americans together, just depending on their generation. So like, you know, it, while it starts specific, like I really do think the book is about sort of the American experience and, it, and it's about using noir to talk about that. Absolutely, man. No, and again, I love that truly there are so many other voices that are that are really uh, being heard now in comics. Yeah, no, it's 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 you an know. exciting time in that place. You mentioned Ram, and like I'm I'm a huge fan of his work. Like you know, I love those Savage Shores. I'm really excited yes. for his new book, uh, The Many Deaths of Layla Star, that came out yep. last week. So uh, that book's great. So you know, so yeah, I'm I'm you know. Uh, Mariko Tamaki is a fantastic voice. I loved what is it? Laura Dean keeps breaking up with me. You know, I've been a huge fan of Gene Yang for so long. It's been really wonderful to kind of watch him kind of get this like mainstream rise where, you know, he's doing Shang-Chi over at Marvel and yes. Superman Batman over at DC. So there's a lot of, you know, Greg Pak's do, doing the Star Wars book. So there's a lot of like really interesting people doing work right now. A hundred percent, man. Do you want to uh, get back to uh, working at either of the big two? And are there characters I, you want to write? And, it, and obviously, not only Asian characters, but oh I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Do you? There's you a know? lot of there. There's a lot of characters. Uh, I I would I would work on a big two sort of book in a second. The biggest challenge for me is always my schedule. I kind of balance, um, you know, TV writing and comic book writing. And there's sure. I, there's these two plates I'm desperately trying to like not hit the ground at the same time. And so a lot of times, you know, I've been invited uh, into both sort of ponds to sort of play it. And a lot of times it just comes down to schedule. And so, you know, the second I can make my schedule work, I will try to make my schedule work. But, uh, you know, it's just it's just tricky. Hey, congrats on uh, Cloak and Dagger. I thought uh, Thank it was you. a great... I thought it was a great uh, series, and I'm sorry you kind I of love it. cut short. Yeah, because I uh, love that show. No, it really, that show. and and it was, you know the great thing about a lot of these adaptations are they're familiar and new at the same time. Yeah, and that's yeah. And really we just wrapped up Falcon and Winter Soldier as yeah, and that yep. I mean, again, man, shit. I, I was on that story back in the '80s when they first introduced John Walker. Oh yeah, like the, the Cap No More thing. Yeah, cool. yeah, and 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 certainly, yeah, goddamn, but you know, also the Isaiah uh, Bradley story. Yeah everything and it's like god they spun this in a new way and that's what they should do because yeah. and obviously with uh with uh, Kirkman and what they're doing with the invincible cartoon right, as right. well and that's the yeah. great thing man because you don't want to just sit there and be like all right yeah. they did that yeah they did that and it's like no man they should be there should be surprises there and i definitely felt that with cloak and dagger 
Yeah, thank you. I mean, I you know Joe Pekaski was a showrunner on that show, and he's was such a great boss and such a great showrunner. And I'm I was a fan on that show before I got the job, so I was thrilled to sort of have a chance to work on it. So I yeah I I have nothing but am- amazingly great things to talk to say about that show and that entire experience. That's outstanding, man. No, that's very cool. Do you want to rattle off any of the uh, other heroes that you wouldn't mind having a crack at? It? Oh God, um, God, what? You, uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. Um. I, I would love I would love to do this is on in like no particular order so this is like a complete yeah, yeah, grab bag yeah, uh, I would you know I got a chance to do like a Doctor Strange short story and it that kind of wet you know wetted my teeth for wanting to do more Doctor Ooh. Strange um, you know I I love Shang Chi and Jimmy Woo it's like the chance to write those two characters would be great. Totally agree. Uh, you know over at DC like you know you know the Trinity Superman. Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. They're fantastic. I've got a I've got a soft spot for Green Arrow. I've got a soft spot for Firestorm too. Cool. Um, you know, there but there's a t- I, I'm also like a huge sort of Spider-Man fan, but at the same time I also sort of feel like to do Spider-Man right, you have to actually write like an ongoing Spider-Man book. Cause like to me, like it's like Stan Lee and Steve Dicko and John Romita Jr. Like part of that character is like the soap opera. Sure. And so like, I, to, in my opinion, there's only like one really classic Spider-Man story, self-contained Spider-Man story, and that's Craven's Last Hunt. And all the Very other good. great Spider-Man stories are like runs, you know? It's like Stan Lee's run, Bendis's run, Roger yeah. Stern's run, Yeah, you know? Sure. Yeah, absolutely, man. No, you're right. No, that's a, even Zdarsky doing yeah, sensational for the length of time he did it. Yeah. No, I hear you, man. Absolutely. That's, that's yeah. really good. Dude, I got to tell you. I, I anytime somebody mentions Jimmy Woo, I immediately like Bing because <laughs> the first time I ever read his stories was in that What If issue. Oh, cool! Uh, from the late seventies of uh, the so 1950s cool. Avengers, and when Parker and Hardman and everybody else did Age yeah. of Atlas, I was all over that. And I yeah, thought, no, it's was, so... yeah. And so when Randall <laughs> Randall Park right played him in uh, yeah, 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 he's like killing it on that role. Yeah. Oh my. God, and I and you know I really hope Jimmy shows up in uh, Shang Chi and everything. I, yeah. I have a feeling he probably will. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I love I love that character. He's also like, you know, he also has the benefit of being you know he was introduced in the 1950s, but he's also like one of the few Asian characters in in, co- in mainstream comics that isn't sort of a legacy character or like built on some kind of Asian stereotype. So he's kind of very special for those reasons as well. So I I think he's a fantastic character. Absolutely, and it and yeah, you know, now regarding that. Because unfortunately, there are some really great uh, prior Asian villains yeah, that yeah. obviously in the time were yeah. demonized beyond the obvious and really, you know, and that's why I won't call him the blank claw, but like <laughs> the, uh, the original, yeah. the, you know, the original villain of, of Jimmy Woo and everything. I mean, I like, and the same can be said for Fu Manchu in terms of, yeah. I like that Moriarty aspect. Yeah. These guys just, you know, Kind of pulling the strings, yeah. And being you know the the masterminds by these criminal empires and stuff. Well, in in my opinion, the best uh the best sort of Asian sort of Moriarty Fu Manchu sort of type is what Josh Dysart was writing in in Har- Harbinger, like to- Toyo Harada. Like that is like such a great that archetype sort of played so played so well and and just and and I'm like a big fan of what he did in Harbinger and uh and Imperium. I'm so. I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued to see what. Because based on the trailer, we really don't know that much about Shang Chi's background. Yeah, um, I'm really curious. And, and I'm, I'm really, really curious. curious because I really, I mean that that was a really interesting wrinkle to the original Master of Kung Fu series. Yeah, was, that this hero was the son of this great villain. Yeah, and, and also too, like the thing that I don't think people like acknowledge enough about that original series is it had like a killer roster of artists, like Jim Starlin, Paul Gulacy, Mike Zek drew it for three years. Like Gene it is Day. crazy, Gene Day, yeah. Like, oh yeah. my God, the art yeah. was just phenomenal on that book. No, I agree. And that's why, uh, man, I'll, I'll tell you, I give Marvel credit for having the guts to put out the omnibuses or yeah. Omnipi because, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it was such a great series, despite all the stereotypical shit that's in there. Yeah. So, you know? I, I can't wait to so like I have that original I I have that original uh Mensch Glacy sort of run and I have that very geek thing of I'm missing one issue. So until I get that one issue, I can't read like I've read the first three, I'm like, this is awesome, I need all of it. But now I haven't read all of it because I'm just waiting to get that like one issue one last issue in my run. 
but like that stuff is just so good. It's just, yeah. No, I hear you, man. I don't know what other TV stuff you might have cooking that you could talk about. Uh, I can talk about the stuff I've done in the past. I've, you know, I worked on a show called Light as a Feather on Hulu. That's on Hulu now. I worked on a show called Two Sentence Horror Stories on the CW that's available on Netflix now. Okay. I'm working on a show for HBO Max that's on right now, which I, I, I'm embarrassed. I don't know if I can talk about, so I've just so I, I've decided to like, yeah, um, uh, uh, play it safe and just not not mention it. Okay. So, uh, we'll but yeah, but that's um, you know, subsequent conversations we can talk yeah. about it when you can. Tell me about Light as a Feather. I don't know this show. Uh, Light as a Feather was a show. Um, I'm trying to remember. It was, it was kind of like it was almost sort of like a teen girl version of like Final Destination. It was about uh, it, it. It was about these girls who sort of play Light as a Feather, and and one of them gets the ability to sort of see see like their deaths sort of coming, and then they kind of have to sort of stop it. So I. It was coming off of a run of I did a run of like second seasons on shows and it was one of the second seasons that I had worked on and, and I got a chance and there was you know it was um, the showrunner was uh, Lee Fleming Jr. who was the same writer who wrote uh, Can't Hardly no not uh, Can't Hardly uh, she's all that so oh, that, so that that was he's a great guy and so that was super nice to work with him and then uh, yeah Two Cents Horror Story a fantastic writer director by the name of Vera Miao was the uh, creator of that show. And I worked on that show for a couple, uh, for two seasons actually, and uh, and that was sort of a, a really great, and that was sort of a horror anthology, and it, it kind of shared. Me and Vera had a similar intent uh, in our work in that we wanted to do horror stories like Infidel. It's a horror, uh, it's a horror series where it's centered around people of color and uh, and it's very much centered around their experiences. So it's not like you can't like take one person out and replace it with a different person of color or a different person of a different race, the story wouldn't work. And so that was kind of the the uh, the, 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 the reason detra sort of for that show. And so yeah, so that's that's the stuff I've worked on in television. Well, and I see uh, you've had short films that you've directed as well. I have. I and have. I really, uh, uh, it's funny, the 2012 uh, credit, a conversation about cheating with my time travel <laughs> future self. Well, you, you had me at a low with that kind of title. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is, is any of our, our you know shorts are really and it's funny talking the day after the Academy Awards. Yeah. It, I, I'm always intrigued by shorts, and I'm always sad about their limited release. Are any of your uh, directorial efforts uh, running anywhere? Um, uh, conversations about a uh, conversation about cheating with my time traveling future self. It's definitely available on Vimeo. Okay. Um, I, I, it's been so long. I don't know how one. I'll be honest. I don't even know if Vimeo works the same way as it did in 2012. So, um, but it's up there, uh, and in theory, someone could kind of find it. I did another one called Shadow of a Doubt, which I actually don't know if that lives. I think that lived online somewhere, and then the uh, the place that hosted it um, kind of changed. So I so I don't know where one finds it now. But uh, but yeah, for the most part, I've been sort of focusing on my sort of comics and and TV work and. You know, and I love shorts. I think it's a great place. It's a really a great place to sort of like fine tune sort of your mastery of the craft. So I've had a chance to like work on shorts for, you know, shorts for Marvel, shorts for DC and other anthologies. And they're always super fun. They're, I've also found them like, it, I've learned that you can slot them into your schedule. Not necessarily easily, but unlike a, a long, something longer where your pins and needles like, oh my God, it's working to like, you know, fall on top of me, and I've I've overpromised something. A short you can just kind of plug into your schedule very concretely. So I, I love doing them. Have you uh, talked to other comic book people in the community that are also you know doing uh, film and video? I know Greg Pak has his yeah. stuff. Kyle Higgins has his stuff. You I know. you know I yeah I, I talk I you know I I talk to a lot of sort of uh, sort of creators. Um, you know, so, so it, it's funny like. To me, they're all comic book. We're all comic book creators together. And then I have, you kind of have to remind myself, like, oh, you do other things too. Like, you know, Joe Henderson's a friend, and Lord knows, like, Joe is both a comic book creator and like a, a TV guy and like a film guy. But like, you know, from in my head, Joe's my friend through comics. So like, it's it's a lot of like. So yes, uh, but I always have to remind myself that like, oh right, they do other things besides comics because to me, everyone's just we all work in comics together. No, I understand. Uh, people are saying nice things about me. You'll forgive me, but I'll. I'll uh... <laughs> I want to because this is a new uh, watcher, Xavius, and oh, cool. uh, that's nice that he's uh, seeing me live. He, I was on uh, Rob Burnett's uh, YouTube show on Friday. Oh, that's, oh cool! And, uh, you know, and uh, well, you know, that's as as I'm sure you know, you know, you appear on other people's uh, podcasts and video casts and stuff, and it helps you grow your own audience. So yeah, to do that. So thank you, Xavius. It's nice to see you, 
And uh, somebody, oh, my buddy Joe uh, likes my beard. I don't know, man. <laughs> Fifty. I got I got Greek Easter coming up next Sunday. <laughs> may or may not shave. I don't know. It's kind of Ernest Hemingway. I, I like I like the Ernest Hemingway look. You know, I got, I, I got to see if it'll uh, cover the other chin or not. Uh, you know that then that'll I think that'll make the final determination <laughs> if I keep it. Um, <laughs> Geez, I you know, I, and I don't know. Do you have a hard out that you need at the top of the hour? Uh, I I I don't have a hard out. I do have to get out around that time, but it's not a hard out. Okay, no worries, man. I mean, what else yeah, can we yeah. talk about? I mean, again, this seriously, this book looks amazing, and Thank you. you know, Portsack was really kind to to let me read not only the first two issues that I'm showing the covers of Dave Johnson, but the third issue as well. And uh, really, I, I love where it's going. And uh, yeah, again, I mean, I, I'm. I, Crime books, I'm always there. That's and I don't, okay. beyond, beyond this story, are you going to write more crime books? I, I want to. I want to. Like, I'd like to more, write more crime books sort of in this vein. I, I, it's funny. I joke with my friends that I'm not a real comic book creator because I, I, I can't focus on, like, four projects at once, which, like, I feel like the real comic book creators focus on, like, four <laughs> or five books simultaneously. Yeah. I, you know, focus on one book at a time and sort of go for there. So right now, like the other crime stories I want to tell are more sort of good Asian sort of stories. Cool. Um, but I would love to, you know, I, it's, it's also too, you know, and it's also part of my nervousness. Like the bar on crime comics are so high, you know, you've got Brubaker, you got Darwin Cook, you got Jason Aaron, you got Azarello, you got Bendis. Rucka. So like, yeah. yeah, Rucka. Yeah. So like just doing everything I can to kind of like, you know, like, yeah, to just sort of hit, you know, when people think crime comics, like you instantly, Frank Miller, you think of like the greats of like, uh, sure. of, of comic book creators. So trying really hard just to not, like, not to embarrass myself out of that, out of that company. Well, don't worry, you know, Ed Brisson uh, needs company. So that's okay. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's a good, more recent creator that's been that's doing true. books and stuff. That's, he's but doing yeah, great that's stuff. And again, there is absolutely room for more Asian oriented uh, crime so. uh, books. I think this is. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, again, I, I I really applaud what you're doing, man. It's uh, I thank you, man. And then yeah, it's no, it's great, and truly, I'm so glad that we've connected. And yeah, uh, yeah I look I look forward to, to future conversations. I, I Same really here, man. Yeah. So everybody, really, starting next Wednesday from Image, first yes. issue of Good Asian, and uh, this is the cover you could be looking for that amazing Dave Johnson cover. Amazing I didn't Dave. want to show interiors because I didn't want to get into spoiler territory anyway. Oh. I, I appreciate. I mean, you you absolutely. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know what's a spoiler, what's not. The there's some R and pages in the middle that uh that I think we have previewed online. So okay. so so those are up up for grabs. But uh but yeah but 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 yeah no I, I appreciate you having me on. I oh, I'm, I'm a yeah. fan of the show. <laughs> oh, that's really nice, man. Thank you. How how can tell people where they can find you? And oh, I am real underscore porn sack on Twitter and real underscore PSAC on Instagram because I found out you can't have the word the syllable porn in your Instagram name. They won't hilarious. Let you. Yeah, so that's how I found that out. That's why the names are different. Uh, but yeah, but the, that's where I am. That's where I am online. That's a, and it, and forgive me. Is this is Pornsack a, a a pen name or is it your, your no? Name? It's my real name. It's it's ah. Thai. So uh, in sure. yeah, Thai, Thai uh, porn means wish and sack means sacred. So it uh, translates backwards to sacred wish. Interesting. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. See, I would never go by my Greek name, which is Ioannis. Oh wow, John is much easier. Yeah, yeah, I can see how many people <laughs> find John easier. I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Pornsack, I'm so glad to meet you, and truly. Really happy to have you on, and truly, the okay. good agent is outstanding. Can't Thank recommend you. it enough. And uh, yeah, so and everyone else will be on the uh, on the story next Wednesday. So right, sounds uh, good. This was a great conversation. I really thank appreciate you. It. No, thank out. you for having want, me. I don't want. Oh yeah, absolutely. I don't want you to wink out yet, but uh, I'll I'll say goodbye to everybody now. Okay. Tomorrow uh, morning on Word Balloon Live. Well, depending on where you are, it'll be eleven o'clock a.m. on the West Coast, but it'll be one o'clock in the afternoon here. I'm uh, talking to Rob uh, Paulson. The great uh, animated actor who got, you know, Yakko from Animaniacs and Pinky from Pinky in the Brain and two of the Ninja Turtles among his credits. So uh, really looking forward to talking to him. And uh, what else can I tell? Oh, Ben, I recorded an amazing conversation with Garth Ennis uh, earlier, which was great, talking about his new uh, war comic, Tankies, which actually is a representation of one of his older war comics. And uh, tonight on Word Balloon Live, Jason Aaron joins us to uh, talk about... Uh, his adventure run, and obviously uh, get, getting into uh, hit the Heroes Reborn uh, new event that'll be starting very soon. So all that coming up this week on Word Balloon Live. I am uh, not going to be 
broadcasting live on Thursday or Friday because I'm getting my second shot on Thursday. And I don't know if I'm going to be on my ass or I'm going to be okay, but I figure let's not, you know, plan anything and have to cancel it. So uh, until then, uh, thanks a lot for watching today. Pornsec, again, thank you for joining me. Thank you. And uh, everybody stay safe, stay happy, and stay healthy.